First, a little about, a little about me. Um, I am Jessica States. I'm the Information Security Officer here at Fort Hayes. So I work over in Technology Services in Tomanic, and my job is basically just kind of taking care of all things IT security for us. Um, I have a technical background um, in networking and server administration, so I do a lot of monitoring logs and just keeping on top of all the threats and everything coming out, making sure everyone else in my department's kind of knows what they're supposed to be doing security-wise and here to answer questions when they have them. And I give a lot of talks like this. Um, so what I wanted to go over today is just basically the recent threats we were seeing uh, for online or for Fort Hayes students. These are things that I've seen this school year, and most of the examples I'll use are things that students have reported to me. Um, I try to keep it pretty recent, so I keep it within the year uh, because these things are constantly evolving. Uh, so we'll kind of go over how some of those online scams work, and then just some basic steps for protecting yourself. And I will say I know it's always hard for me to judge the room like. You know, I might have cybersecurity students that obviously know all of this, and I might have people that, you know, haven't really experienced much of this before. So my challenge to you is if you are on that end of the spectrum where you know all of this, take this information and share it with someone else. That's part of your responsibility then is to educate others uh, because everything you do online, right, it's going to affect everyone else. So there's my plug for that if you are doing all all right, so job scams. You've probably seen these in your Fort Hayes Gmail. Uh, we've been getting tons of them this semester. I don't know why. Just they kind of pop up every now and then. These are three examples, but they've all had just, they come from different addresses. The subjects will be a little different. Most of them are fairly targeted. So they'll say Fort Hayes State University in the subject, or they'll say MHSU or internship offer. They're definitely targeted at college students. The, um, the email addresses, a lot of them are like the Gmail address, but like this one was mccd.edu, so this is actually, uh, I can't remember what, they, what college it was. I contacted their security folks and said, hey, we're getting a lot of this stuff, and they said, oh yeah, we have a student's account that was compromised and it's being used to send these. So it kind of shows you, you know, one person getting their account compromised can then lead to all sorts of other issues. Um, but they, they acted pretty quick on that and, and took care of that, which was great. Um, so how do these work? They do a few things that are interesting. So the body doesn't really have anything in it. It just says see attachment. The attachments are usually a text file or a Word document, sometimes a PDF. Um, the reason they do this is because most email firewalls are going to look at the body of the message and analyze it for all sorts of things. It kind of tries to look at the intent of the message, keywords that usually mean it's a scam all sorts of different things. They have tons of algorithms built in, yeah, which they don't make public for obvious reasons, right? The scammers would right, use that to be better scammers. So they do it in an attachment because most email firewalls aren't going to actually analyze the attachment. Some do. So this is what the attachments look like. Oh, and I should say, to make it even more relevant, uh, one of our students did fall for this um, to the tune of about $2,000, or a little more than $2,000. Um, he thought it was a legit job offer, and, and yeah, go for that. Um, and this is exactly what he would have read. I underlined stuff. Obviously, they didn't do that. Um, so this was what was in the attachment. So they're saying they were that you were referred by the University Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce, which I don't know what that is, but apparently it sounded official to the scammer. Um, they say that. This job basically takes an hour a day, three times a week, so three hours a week, for $450 weekly. That should be a tip off, right? Like, that's a lot of money for three hours of work. That's more than most people on campus make, probably. So, um, and then the guy's unable to meet for an interview because, bless his heart, he is helping disabled students, right? So that's why you can't talk to him, and you're not going to have a traditional sit down job interview, right? So this. If you're quickly reading through this and you're currently in a situation where you need a job like now, this may look good to you. You never know. Um, and, and it also says you're going to be paid in advance. Even better if you're really desperate for a job right now, right? And this is all you have to do to apply. He wants your name and address, your phone number, your age, um, 
and an alternate email different from school email. That's also important. They want to get you off of my email system because they know I'm looking at this stuff. Not that I'm reading your email, I actually can't. But whenever someone reports one of these to me, I go and say, okay, who sent email to that email address? And then I email those students and say, hey, I see that you replied to a known scammer. I don't know what you said to them, but just so you know, you were talking to a scammer. And then that usually stops it. So they want you to get off of our email system and onto Gmail or you know, like your private email where no one's going to be <coughs> checking on that stuff or blocking their email address like we do. Common tactics they use. And then, yeah, we, it goes undetected by us because we have no insight into that. Um, and I do, as soon as I find out about these scammers, I do block their email addresses so that you know, they can't send us any more junk. But like I said, we've already contacted them in another means. Um, nothing I can do to help them. All right, so this Dr. Roland, they're usually doctors, which is impressive. Um, always have some sort of doctor. So then the way this works, these are usually fake check scams. Everyone I've seen is a fake check scam, and that's what this one that, that this um, student cell phone was. So Dr. Roland sent the first paycheck along for extra for supplies or training. There's always a whole host of reasons there's extra money attached to the check. I've seen all sorts of interesting things. I've seen, here's your first week's pay, plus I really, you know, I'm in China and I need to send a Google gift card to my nephew for his birthday, so I sent you the extra money for that, so go get that Google Play card and send it to me. Uh, take pictures of the front and back, and so I can send it to him for his birthday, and his birthday's today, and I have to do this right now. Um, it's always a sense of urgency. So you're asked to deposit the money, and then wire part of the money or buy a gift card and send a gift card. And this is where people don't quite understand how banks work, and this gets them. So after you deposit the cash or check and you send the money, then your bank finds out that the check was phony and takes that money back out of your account, but you've already sent part of it away. So the crook already has the money, and you're responsible for that difference. So true or false? When you deposit a check or a money order into your account, does your bank make sure it's good before they put the money in your account? What do you guys think? Most people think this is true. They think your bank verifies that that check is good before they let you spend the money. And this is false. And this is where a lot of people get this. They think, oh, I deposited the check. It showed up as a memo in my account. It must be legit. That is wrong. The reason is that your bank has a legal obligation to get you the cash quickly within one to two days. And if you have online banking, like with my bank, a lot of it'll show up as a, it'll say memo next to it. And then after it actually completely clears, then it'll, they'll get rid of that memo line and it'll just be in my account. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I see on my uh, bank accounts is it says available balance and current balance. Yes. And the available balance is typically where all of this, uh, I believe, the Float. And that's exactly it, yeah, the available balance, balance versus the current balance. The current balance would be what is actually physically in, like it's there. And the available balance is, is what you can spend, but it's not necessarily all of it there. Um, so, let me go to my next my picture. So basically what happens, and where this all comes in with the available and current balance, so you give your bank a check. And they basically, at that point, trust that it's that you made sure that that was a valid check. The financial system runs on trust. They're saying, all right, you must know this person you're depositing this check. So they put the money, they basically let you borrow the money. They put it in your account. They send the check to a clearinghouse in the region from where the originating bank was, the bank that the check was written on. It goes to the bank. They look at it. This is, this is where they figure out that it's a scam, right? So they either say, yes, this is our account, and it has this amount of money, and then they send that money to your bank, which then covers the money that your bank basically let you borrow um, from them, and then it becomes current balance, gets rid of the memo status on your account. If it's a fraud, then the bank tells your bank, um, nope, we're not sending you money for this check. It's, we don't have that account, or what have you, that's a fake check. And your bank says, okay, can't borrow that any money, that money anymore. You don't get it. They take it back out of your account, or not take it back out of your account, but you know, get rid of that line. 
So that's kind of how it works. This can take a couple of weeks depending on where the clearinghouse is, where the banks are, especially if it's, it's international. It can take a while. Sometimes it does take long. Uh, the scammers know this, so they will make sure that they get you a check that has a different regional <coughs> clearinghouse than where you're at to make it take longer to figure this out. In the case of this unfortunate student who fell for this, he had deposited multiple checks before a bank teller was like, something doesn't seem right here. Um, where did you get this check? What's going on? And he thought all that money was fine, but it had been a couple of weeks and they still hadn't completely cleared. So that's how he ended up losing all that. Um, so, you know, how do you protect yourself? And it's tough. This is a fake check. They even put the watermarks in it so that when it was scanned, it said void. I don't know if you've ever tried to scan a check or anything, but they, they will have watermarks in it. It's a totally legit check. It looks perfect. Um, bank tellers usually would even think that this looks fine. No one's going to notice until it gets to the originating bank and then looking at, at the account numbers and everything. So looking at the checks, that's, that's not really going to help you. It all comes down to just kind of, I hate to say common sense because that makes it feel like you're stupid if you fall for it and you're not, uh, but it, it comes down to just being aware of, of what's going on and what these scams are like. So just remember that there's never a legitimate reason why your employer is going to send you a check and then ask you to send money somewhere um, for the first check. Like that's really suspicious. Um, and know how that works. Know that you don't want to spend that money until it's, it's completely cleared into your account. If you have questions about that, ask someone at your bank. They would be more than happy uh, to explain it all to you and let you know, like, has the check cleared or not. Um, and this is so true online. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, this is where, especially a lot of our younger students get caught, is they think it's coming to my Fort Hayes email address, it sounds really good, it talks about Fort Hayes, it must be legitimate. Well. If they would just take a second, pause, and think about it, it really seems too good to be true. Um, and check out potential employer, employers. So with these scams, that Dr. Rowling guy they're impersonating, you're probably going to be able to find him on LinkedIn, and you'll find that he's probably a professor somewhere. But if you would actually email the address that he lists on his LinkedIn profile or whatever, and say, hey, I got this job offer from you, he would say, what? No. I'm not looking for, I'm not going to pay someone 450 bucks a week to check my mail. Like, that's ridiculous. So you can check these things out. The big thing is not to get caught up in a sense of urgency. So, and this is just kind of general too. So money transfers. The reason criminals like these, they're really fast and they're hard to track. So basically, by the time you even notice it's a scam, they've already picked it up in cash and you're done, like you can't get that back. Uh, they'll use a false identity to pick it up so it's, they can't be caught. So really for money transfer services, it's not that they're broken, it's just that only send funds to people you've met in person and known for a long time and that you know that's who's picking up the transfer, right? Because we've also seen scams like that where they call and you know, this is your grandson and I'm in jail, I need you to send me bail money. We see things like that too. So make sure that you know that's who it's actually going to. Ask them some questions that only they would know, and, and check those things out. Gift cards are the new thing, uh, because we've all kind of gotten wary of wire transfers, and people like me are out there telling people, hey, you know, don't you know, be aware of that. So now they're asking for gift cards. And again, this is because it's pretty much untraceable. Once they redeem the gift card, you're not gonna get your money back. I've talked to Google, I've talked to Apple, trying to help people with this, and they're like, too bad, you know, that's that's on you. You should have you were supposed to treat it like cash. You didn't, so sorry, we're not going to help you. Um, which makes sense. Like it's in their terms of service. That if you give the gift card to someone, then then they're not going to help you. Um, but again, it's it's very fast. It's difficult to trace. So, any questions about job scams or check scams? Or? Jessica, I just want to have you repeat. So. Fort Hayes State students, they get that email, and as long as they're staying within the Fort Hayes email address, you could probably help them. But if they did give the alternate a Gmail or Yahoo, they're SOL. Um, basically, yeah, because if, if it's within our email system, I'm actively blocking those scamming addresses and, and trying to look for those things. Mm -hmm. um, I don't catch them all, I obviously can't. But yeah, once it's outside of our email system, 
is really not, <laughs> it's on them to figure out that it's a scam and stop it themselves, yeah. Is there any sort of financial protection against these scams? Like, can you as a student get insurance that will protect you, or does your bank have insurance? That's a good question. Is there any sort of safety net? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I would probably refer that to a financial institution, your financial institution, talk to your bank about it. I don't know the answer there. It's way out of my room. That's a good question. Any others about job scams or tech scams? Some of this kind of breach or goes from cyber into real world. I just kind of see how they, they try to transfer you back to the real world uh, with the physical checks. And then it kind of, it does kind of get a little out of my all right, next one is extortion. This is one from Monday. I told you, current example. Right? So this came to a faculty member, but we see them for students as well. Uh, I just, I don't know, like this one, because her password was fun. Um, so this is a new kind of extortion scam they're running, um, where the subject is going to be your username and a password that you have previously used, hopefully not one you are currently using. These are usually from data breaches that are several years old. Um, but this gets people because seeing your password in plain text, it, it kind of jarring. Like it makes you just like, how did they get that? Um, yeah, I'm sure you're all reading it. Um, basically, Somebody actually use that as their password. Oh yeah. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's actually better than a lot that I see. Um, I see a lot that would just be 1313. Okay. It works. Um, yeah. The word password is used password a lot, like you'd be surprised if people do that. <laughs> I, I see all kinds of things. I thought people would have already learned by now. No. No. <laughs> they haven't. That's that's part of why I do these talks, because yeah, um, what seems like common sense to some people, um, other people would think, well, no one would guess that Fifi1313 is my password. No one would guess that. They don't realize it's really easy for a computer to figure that out. Um, eight characters is just not. But yeah, so in this case, it was a password from several years ago, um, and it was probably an okay password then, um, but not anymore. So, you know, they're, they're saying basically, we have videos of what you've been watching online and also videos of your webcam at the same time. We're gonna send that to all of your contacts unless you give us $977. I cut off the bottom, but they want that in Bitcoin. Pretty common, um, they're looking for untraceable things. And they helpfully give you their Bitcoin address and, and explain how Bitcoin works to you, which is very nice of them. Um, you know, they want to make sure you're educated. So, yeah, we see a lot of these, and it's not always like this type of thing, but it's a lot of different things. So, the question I always get asked is, how did they get my password? And, and the answer is, well, there have been a ton of data breaches. You hear about these on the news, and, and maybe you don't quite understand or know what it means. They don't always go into a lot of details because it gets really technical and boring to pretty much everyone that's not like me. Um, but these Yahoo, eBay, PlayStation, PlayStation's been a big one. Um, they had data breaches where basically usernames and passwords were stolen. Sometimes those passwords were stored in clear, clear text, which is like a super no-no, you're never supposed to do that. We don't do that here, by the way, ever. Um, or sometimes they'll steal what's called a hash from the password and then they will take that and break into it and figure out what the password is. They then sell those lists of usernames and passwords on the, on the dark web or sometimes, you know, they're just do-gooders. They just put them out there for anyone to use. Very nice of them. Um, and they're just floating on the internet everywhere. So scammers are going to use any personal information they can get about you to make the scam seem more realistic. And putting your password in there is like a great way, right? Because it does, it jars you every time. You're like, oh, I, that is my password. Um, yeah, great. I mean, look, I even referenced the New York Times article about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is a recent one too, yeah, 2018. So it, it doesn't just happen. So what do you do? The first thing is don't panic. Like, I say this constantly, like, I don't know if anyone reached, has read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but that's like my thing. Don't panic. Number one, just don't panic. It's okay. Don't reply to these people. I don't know. Don't even reply to say, hey, I know you're a scammer or insult them or whatever. Like, don't, I know it feels good, but don't do it. Because then they know it's a legit email address and you're just going to get more stuff. So don't do it. If you still use that password anywhere, PP1313 is no longer a good password. It's burned. It's done. Do not use it. Don't just change it to PP1313 too. They will try that. They're going to add on common things and try those as well. 
um, and change it anywhere you use it, and then hopefully learn your lesson that you should have unique passwords everywhere, which is overwhelming, and we'll get to that later. Mark the emails as spam or phishing and delete them. Um, in our Gmail system, any Gmail system, but uh, when you mark it as spam or phishing, that lets Google kind of, they, they analyze that and they can use that to mark things as junk in the future. So it kind of helps their system learn what is, what is fraudulent. Any questions about extortion or how they do all of this? Has Fort Hayes ever paid any extortion money? Fort Hayes <laughs> yeah. has not. Okay. I don't know if any individuals <coughs> have done so. No one has ever admitted to me that they have done that. It wouldn't surprise me, honestly. But. Have you ever heard of a case where someone fished someone like that and then they actually went through with I'm not sure how they could actually go through with the threat that they're talking about. Uh, that's a lot of, uh, that would take a lot of work. <laughs> um, the, there'd be several pieces of malware installed on your computer. It would be recording at the right time. I mean, it's it's a lot that they would have to go through to get that amount so of So they're basically time. just blowing smoke. Okay, oh yeah, no, they haven't done any of that. The only thing they know about you is your username and password, that's it. They don't, they have not installed anything on your computer. None of that is real, they're lying. So, you know, ransomware and things like that do exist, but that's a very different scam. This is just kind of a low level, they just blank it out. Uh, when I see these sorts of things, I'll see thousands of them come in at the same time. You know, they obviously haven't infected all of those computers, they're just casting a wide net, seeing who has a guilty conscience and will, and will pay the ransom. So, if you think about it, it's, it's basically free for them to send millions of emails, right? The one statistic I was looking at earlier is there are 100 million phishing emails that go out every day. Even if 99% of them are blocked, which would be awesome, like our can lock money for our email firewall and it can do about maybe 75%. Um, even if 99% are blocked, that's still a million that get through, right? Like that's a lot. And if even just one person falls for it, they've made you know $977 in Bitcoin for very little work. So they just keep casting these wide nets and people keep falling for it. Bad things, they probably do make a lot of money off of it. They make a ton. So many people do fall for it. Yeah. It's a, um, gosh, I can't remember. There, were, there was one in, it was fake tech support scams where they called you and said, hey, your computer's infected. We had that going on last year. Um, they said in two months they made about $24 million doing that, just running that scam. Nobody's immune to it. I mean, because it's just a matter of persuasion. Yeah, if it's they were persuasive enough, they could probably convince you. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's, it's what we call social engineering in my field. Um, it's just the art of deception. It's, and they're good at it. Uh, if you've seen Catch Me When You Can, the Frank Abbott story, I'm dating myself, I guess. But um, he basically sweet talks his way onto airplanes and all sorts of things. And it's just charisma and, and just acting like you're supposed to be there. And that's what these people are doing just in the digital world. And, and they're really good about playing off of our hopes and fears and everything else. So, yeah. <laughs> I've never fallen for one, but I, I still, you know, I, I don't think that I could. I'm, I'm realistic about that. Like, I study this stuff every day, and I am not arrogant enough to think that I will never fall for it, you know. Um, it can happen. So, yeah, it's fine. Um, so, we're about a credential theft, otherwise known as fishing. Oops. All right, this is one that came in on Monday too. Monday was a busy day because I was out of the office and that's when all this stuff happens. Like it just, it's how it goes. It's like, they, I swear they know sometimes. So this one came in and it doesn't look great, but it never fails. Like at least one person will fall for these. Luckily this was a very targeted attack. They just sent it to one person. A pretty uh, high level target and he knows better. So didn't fall for it, but it was a good example. So there are several things here that really should stand out to you. One is that FHSU is not capitalized, right? Like we always capitalize it. And if you look down here, have a great day, FHSU Inc. <laughs> uh, no, we never do that. But they did some good things here. Good as in like they knew what they were doing. It's from FHSU support, which is all right. And then they actually spoofed, these are both the same color, it's the same text, but I'm you know, protecting the innocent here. 
they spoofed his own email address to put in the front line. And so this is why I wanted to put this up here. This can be faked. Um, you can't always trust what the front address, what this part says. This is, I we call this the display name. This can say anything. Um, and they can spoof the email address itself. And unless you're actually looking at the email headers, you wouldn't know that, which most people don't do unless you are a nerd like me. So um, this one looks kind of legit. Like it looked like he was getting an email from himself. The link, if you would have, see I did an image, but if you would have hovered over it, it went to some crazy address, not an FHSU.edu address, which is where we would always send you for something like this. Um, we also don't do access verifications. So. Um, and the language is also just goofy, but the thing you have to remember, for people especially who English is not their first language, um, grammar mistakes are not a big indication of phishing. So, um, while I, I do put some emphasis on that, it's not always the greatest tool to figure out that it's phishing. Uh, plus, I've seen official emails come out that have some pretty glaring mistakes. So, you know, we always do that So that was a real one we got my name. Some of you may have seen some of these last semester. They were running rampant on campus. Um, yeah, we had, uh, we had some issues where that actually, that, People, multiple people fell for that, and that actually interfered with uh, some some organizations on campus. Yeah, this one, um, at last count, when I was looking, I had over 300 accounts that were compromised by this one. Um, now, of our 100,000 Gmail accounts, like, <coughs> but what they what happened was one person's password was stolen, and I. I haven't been able to trace it back to figure out how that initial one happened. And then they basically replied to every message in their inbox with this. Um, this one, interestingly, is I sent out a notice about a scam email and I started getting these back from compromised accounts, which was fun. Went and took care of it. Um, when you click the link, it took you to a fake login page. You entered your TigerNet ID, username, and password, and now you're compromised. Now your account replies to everyone in your list with this. Um, I had a few really long nights, basically, because this was just spidering everywhere. Uh, what we do for things like this is I go in and I change your password, I disable your Gmail account, so that it stops it from causing any more harm. Changing the password gets the attacker out of your account to protect you. If you are faculty and staff, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I need to do because you have access to other people's information. Uh, but for students, um, you mainly just have access to your own, so change the password, reset the security question, we'll take care of it. Uh, but this did, it just spread like crazy, it's like October, November. Uh, and the, the student organizations were the worst because it, it would reply, like the subject looks good, right? So, um, I can't remember what some of these were, but it would look like someone was replying to the group email about an event coming up. Well, then people would just click it because it looked legit. Uh, it finally died down like, between semesters and it just have gone away. But you kind of see how, yeah, this looked, this looked like you should do it. It came from someone you knew, and it actually did come from them, well, from their account, and the subject looked familiar. So that was a rough one. It seemed like it went to some crazy web page. Uh, most of them were in Latvia and the others were. Uh, luckily, on those, I was able to talk to the people hosting those web pages, like the companies, and they uh, were willing to take them down, which was great. That kind of helped slow it down a little bit. But they aren't always, I always can't find contact information, and then some of them just wanted to talk to me. So. But yeah, more phishing. And then we also have phishing via text and phone call. Has anyone ever got a phishing message via text? No. My husband gets these all the time. I don't know what he has done, but he is like, this is one actually from the New York Times. Hey, I did the Times New York. Um, Amex fraud message. So saying, hey, did you did you just make a charge at Digit Liver? I don't even want to know what that is. Um, you know, one if yes, two to call us, and then they give you their phone number. Well, this is not Amex. Um, if you get something like this, you know, you should call the number on the back of your card. Don't ever trust anything like this. You call the number on the back of your card or log into your account. 
So, phishing, whether it is text or um, email, there's a lot of just common signs. So, kind of go over a few of them. You probably know a lot of them. So, who's it from? Make sure you look at, like, if it's coming from someone that says they're from Fort Hayes, we're not going to use a gmail.com address, right? It's going to be fhsu.edu. Um, and again, that can be faked, but that's, you know, a really blaring, like, mistake. Uh, the other thing is to look at the reply to. So you have your from address in your email, and then you have your reply to, and they'll set the reply to to some other thing because they want your replies to go to them, right? Like, they don't want it to come to the person they're pretending to be. So look at those. Um, sense of urgency in the subject or anywhere, just that sense of urgency. They're trying to get you to act before you think. Um, anytime someone's really pressuring you to take action quick, take a step back and think about that, or run it by a friend, or just, you know, anything like that, just to kind of reality check yourself a little bit. That's good advice, like, anywhere. Um, generic greetings are another thing, you know, dear customer, dear student, they don't even know your first name. I've been working on this um, here at Fort Hayes with all the, like, system-generated emails we send out of, no, let's, put names in, let's do things like this to make it look less like phishing, um, to kind of help train people um, to look for those those positive signs that it's a legit email. Uh, if they're asking for sensitive data, hopefully everyone knows, don't just send your credit card over email. Um, hover over links, this is something a lot of people don't know. So uh, the text that is on the link, which I'll show you. I always do links this way, like I have down here at the bottom. I always type out the whole link, uh, but when you hover over it, you see a little box pops up that would tell me where that link actually goes to. That's what you want to look at, not what this text here says. I can make this say anything. I can make it say, you know, fhsu.edu, but the actual link goes somewhere else. You want to look at what that actual URL is, uh, the actual website address, and make sure that it's what you expect. Um, they're, it's usually pretty obvious, right, that it's, that it's a scam. On a mobile device, you uh, tap and hold. Be careful with that. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but uh, sometimes I won't tap long enough or I'll jitter or something and accidentally tap the link. So, like, I don't know, that makes me nervous. I tend to just check email on something with the mouse. Again, I'm probably showing my age, right? Um, and then attachments. Um, if you're not expecting the attachment, don't open it, even if, if it's from a friend, like their account could be compromised. Call them and ask, like, hey, did you send this, or text them, or whatever. Um, don't email them, email them and say, hey, did you send this? I have some, I have a, a vast collection of hilarious conversations between scammers and people that are like, yeah, of course I said that, go ahead and open it. <laughs> yeah, so don't, don't just reply, hey, did you send this? Um, for an attachment, mm -hmm. uh, I know, uh, at least here, there are, there are a lot of people, uh, especially in the staff and faculty, that have those S-MIME uh, things. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I know it's an encryption of some sort, and it shows up as an attachment sometimes. Yeah. How, how do you distinguish between that and uh, an attachment that's something suspicious? <laughs> Those are kind of tricky. Um, those you never actually need to open. Yeah, those are very um, so I always just kind of ignore them. But I mean, you know how you see the little little clip that says an attachment when you open something? I guess I guess for me, sometimes I've kind of gotten to know, okay, this instructor always has that, or this person always has that with it. But is there a better way? That's basically it, um, knowing what's normal. Um, and knowing that, yeah, every time this person sends me an email, you know, they've got a image in their signature, and so it's going to show up as an attachment, or you know, um, knowing what norm knowing what's normal is, is a big thing, and that can be hard because how do you how do you learn what's normal, right? Because um, the first time you get it, it's going to look suspicious. Um, but just uh, the big thing is, if you aren't sure, don't open the attachment. Like err on the side of caution. Just don't open it. Um, maybe ask the person, you know, hey, what, what is this thing on your email, what's going on? Um, with the SMIME stuff, they probably won't be able to explain it, but, <laughs> um, or ask, you know, your favorite computer nerd somewhere, you know, what they think about it. Um, 
that's actually a big part of my job is people forward me all this suspicious email and they're like, hey, what is this? Uh, it's great. Like, my inbox is just full of junk all the time. Um, you know, and I let them know, yes or no. <laughs> I'm the human spam filter. <laughs> but, you know, it's good. I'd rather they do that than like open it, and, you know, we have ransomware on campus or you know, what. Um, sorry, I keep checking the time. I don't want to like go over. Um, and there's, I'll, I have the link somewhere else, but there's a phishing quiz that Google put together that's really good. It's at the end. Um, and it's cool to check out, even if like you know that you've shown someone else. Okay, so the other thing with phishing, report it. Like this actually helps. It truly does, especially with your Gmail account. If you report phishing and spam, that, I said that earlier, um, helps Google know like what to block in the future. So it's pretty easy to do, just next to the reply there's a little three dots, and if you click on that you'll say report phishing and report spam. Make sure you know the difference. So the difference is intent. Spam is marketing, it's annoying, basically. Like, it's annoying. Phishing is malicious. They're trying to get you to give them money or your password or something. It's, kind of had, it's, it's the evil spam. Um, so, and those are different reports in Google, right? Because they're kind of basically different engines that they use to detect that stuff. So report it to Google, that's great. You can also report it to me. I do not want your spam. I'm just gonna put that out there, I don't want your, your spam. If it's just annoying marketing stuff, I can't do anything to help you with it. The best thing you can do is report it to Google with the spam filter so that it learns to start blocking that thread for you. But if you get a phishing message or a job scam or something malicious like that, evil intent, um, send it to me. I want the full headers, which I will show you how to do. Um, and it's fish at fhsu.edu is what I use for that. Um, I say send it to me. Other people look at that as well. Um, you're also welcome just to send it directly to me, but I do take a day off every now and then. So I'm trying to get everything directed over to this fish one um, because me and the e have been all monitor that. To do the full headers, I'll have to bring in my inbox here. And I will show you how to do that. You've lost your image. Okay, yeah, it's bad. You might try duplicating the screen if you were <coughs> using the uh, outline. Dude. I hit escape. And, um, and of course, I'm on my personal one. Should have pulled up my work one. Um, so you just open the message. Um, and if you go here to the next to the reply, it's got the three dots. And go to you've got the report spam and report pushing. And then you also have show original. And it's gonna open this up with all this great nerdy looking stuff. This is what I want right here. This is the good stuff. Um, put copy to clipboard, and then you paste that in a new message to fish it up again. Yes? If we just forward you the message, will you get this, or do we have to do something special? If you forward it to me, I will. <laughs> From your faculty, if you're, uh, or faculty and staff account. So it, Fort Hayes Outlook is a little different. Um, actually have access to the emails in there so when you send it to me I can go grab the headers but with Gmail we don't all we can see is the sender and the subject line so I actually need the headers if you're sending it to me from your Gmail account so it is a little different for students versus faculty and staff. Does, does that apply to uh, student employees if we're using the Outlook account then, if then we can send yeah. the if email it's the Outlook we're account. using? Yeah, so if it's within our Outlook system, you can just forward it directly to fish at fhsu.edu, but if it's within Gmail, you're going to need to do, to get me the headers. Um, I could teach a whole class on how to read email headers. It's so much fun, but um, it actually shows me like where it came from and a whole bunch of other information that I can use to track down like what's going on with this message and to block where it came from and all sorts of different things. Um, can't hide from the email headers. So. Um, that's useful information for me. So yeah, that's how you do that. Uh, I always do that. Look at the projector when my screen's right here. So yes, report the fishing. That helps a lot. Um, Usually at least once. 
during one of my presentations, the computer will just flip out just to remind me this wrong. But there we go. Um, report it is, is super helpful because that is usually how I find out about what's going on in our student system, um, student email system, and then can take some action. You'll you know, sometimes get emails from me that I'll send out to all our email users saying, hey, this bad thing happening. Um, and that, that's how I find out about it. So I do appreciate it. Any questions about fishing? It's like a huge subject. People are getting more used to dealing with it. All right, I'm gonna just move on to some like general tips. Um, kind of apply to online scams, just any, you know, all sorts of scams. But um, we already talked about, you know, don't wire money to somebody you don't know personally. Um, that's just, that should be a huge red flag. Gift cards as well. Um, sending people gift cards or prepaid credit cards, especially to pay debts. Uh, we're getting close to tax season. We're going to see a lot of tax scams coming up. They'll call you and say, I'm from the IRS. You didn't pay. You need to pay. Send me this. No, the IRS is not going to call you. They will send you a letter. They do not. They do not call ever. They do not email. Uh, they will send you a letter. Um, remember that caller ID can be faked. We had this, I think it was the end of fall semester where someone was actually faking university police their caller ID or their number and calling people and trying to scam them into, I don't even know what, all kinds of stuff. Um, caller ID can be faked. So can the from address. So just, just know that, just be aware of that. You can't necessarily trust that. So those are the don'ts. I like to focus more on the details. Slightly more empowering. Um, so yeah, resist the urge to act immediately. You know, just stop and think. Uh, that's gonna help out a lot with this stuff. Um, usually when I talk to people who have narrowly avoided scams, they're like, I, I started replying and then I thought about it and realized it was a scam. So that's, that helps you out a lot. Check out the story. You know, use your favorite search engine to, to see what's going on. Talk to other students or professors, someone. Just um, get another set of eyes on it. You know, just, this is look okay. Check the URLs. Um, I don't answer any unknown numbers, so I'm sorry, but I don't. Um, that's kind of a good practice that avoids a lot of the scam calls. Um, and then two-factor authentication is like the new thing. Um, it's not really good, it's been around for a while. But um, I'm just gonna go over that really quick because we're gonna be introducing this for students coming this summer. Uh, we're doing employees right now, and then students a little bit later. Um, so two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, we're basically combining something you know with something you have or something you are. Another way to say it is something in your head plus something in your hand. Um, so basically what happens is you enter your password into the website or what have you, and then it sends you something back. You have to prove that you are who you are, and then you get in. So what this means is even if your password is stolen, they still can't get into your account usually. Just, there are ways around this I'm not gonna get into, but um, it is, is way better than just a password. Um, so here at Port Hayes, uh, we've purchased Duo. It's the most common to a base solution for higher ed. And starting Friday, uh, I, it's 2.22, it's Duo day for faculty and staff. Uh, they're gonna be required to use it. And then students that will be coming this summer, we're not going to require it for students, it will be optional. And basically, um, you can use a smartphone app, any phone number, or hardware tokens. There's a lot of methods to prove your identity after your password. Mm -hmm. And I'm just showing you oh. off. Oh, ah, hey, hard, Claire has a hardware token. Yep, I want to. So, yeah, push button, gives you code, makes you feel like a top secret spy. It's cool, get the code. Entered in. I brought it through the washer and it still works. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's a necessity. Um, yeah, so it, it's just like an extra step so that if your password is stolen, they still can't get it. So I think I'm out of time, aren't I? 115? We've got 15 minutes, I, I think, 15 technically. Minutes? Oh, sweet. I'll talk all day about this stuff. I love it. Uh, so you want to use two two factor anywhere you can. Like it's big on the internet. Everyone's finally figuring out. Like people like me have been saying since the '90s that passwords aren't good enough. Uh, I haven't been saying that since the '90s. I'm not that old, but 
Two-factorauth.org lists actually like instructions like what websites have two-factor available and then takes you to the instructions for how to enable it. So do that for your personal email account. It's anything you can. It's much more secure. And really, a lot of websites are going to be forcing it on everyone eventually because it's just passwords just are not good enough anymore. Hopefully, if you've learned anything today, that's what you learned. Passwords are terrible. And then, how do we remember all these passwords? So, password managers, um, I do really kind of advocate for them. So, these are basically encrypted databases where you can store your passwords. For a long time, security people always said, don't write down your passwords. And now we're saying, well, yeah, you need to write them down because there's too many. Uh, just do it in a safe way. So a sticky note on your monitor, go. <laughs> Using something like LastPass or OnePass, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, that's good. I personally use LastPass, so I'll put in a plug for them. Uh, I do like it. Um, this basically gets rid of the worst password practices, which are using weak passwords like BB1313 because that's all you can remember. Um, or reusing the same password on every website, which is also bad because you think about it, that one password is compromised, they're going to go try it on a whole bunch of other websites. Um, we actually see that. It's a fairly common attack that we see here. Um, it's called credential stuffing. They um, just, they'll get a password from somewhere and then they're going to try it against our services to see if that's your TigerNet ID password. And sometimes that is how people's accounts get compromised. You see that. So yeah. This, uh, if you have a password manager, it will remember your passwords for you, but two big caveats. One, your master password must be amazing. Mine is 40 characters. Yes, I remember it. Um, I have it written down somewhere too in case I'm hit by a bus or decide to run away to the Bahamas. That way my husband can get in and pay our bills. So, you know, he knows where it's at. I won't tell you. Um, and two-factor on your password manager, right? So for me to get into my LastPass account, I need to know my password, and I need access to uh, my phone or my husband's phone uh, to approve the authentication. So if you're going to use one, do that. Do your research. Uh, make sure you know what you're using. Oh my gosh, you just keep going. These are just more than okay. Um, Basically, run updates. Very important. I know they're super annoying, but do your updates. Yes, John, he's updated every day. Just go ahead and do it. Um, at home, make sure you're changing the default passwords on your wireless router or any router. Never use default passwords. Um, that's the number one thing that annoying people like me will do when they're trying to get in and see what you're doing. Uh, this is something I help my neighbors with. Like, hey, uh, <laughs> this is open. Let's fix that. Um, know the dangers of public Wi-Fi, use a VPN. Um, when you're here, uh, make sure you're on Tiger Net student and not guest. Guest is full of who knows what. Uh, student's a little more, a little more safe. Um, and then encryption. If you are transmitting sensitive data, make sure you know how to encrypt it. If this is for your job, talk to your resident nerd about it. Um, if you're here at Fort Hayes, talk to me. I'll help you get it encrypted so that it can be sent safely. Um, if it's personal stuff and you don't know how to do it, um, Google it, or like I said, find someone like me that spends all day staring at a computer, we will help you with it. Um, it's very important. Encryption will just basically make it so it's not easily um, stolen. If it is stolen, they can't read it anyway, right? Um, and my learn more slide, it's the last one. Um, these are just some things you can do. Um, so I talked about how like they'll steal usernames and passwords and then post them places. There is this fantastic man um, who runs this website called Have I Been Pwned um, that goes way back into the lead speak days of Packard and way back when. But uh, that website, um, you can go type in your email address and it will tell you if um, it has showed up in any of these data breaches. Where this is really handy then is you can go, okay, so my password was exposed last month, I better change that password, or it was exposed three years ago, do I still use that password? It's not going to tell you exactly what it was, just like this breach, your email address came up. Um, that's super handy. Um, so definitely do that, um, and check all of your different email accounts. Um, again, the two-factor to learn how to put two-factor on all of your accounts, everything. 
the Google Fishing Quiz is really cool. So just if you just Google Google Fishing Quiz, you'll find it. Um, and it actually runs you through some scenarios of real fishes and how it looks with a Google email account, which all of you have, um, and kind of lets you figure out if it's fishing or not, and then kind of tells you how you could have known or, or what, what the signs were. Um, if you are someone who is really good with the fishing stuff, please share that with your parents, children, whoever, um, grandparents, special grandparents, they need to know this stuff. Um, share that with them and run them through it and help explain that to them. Um, and then stopthinkconnect.org is a government, the DHS service, but they have a lot of really good cybersecurity tips if you ever have questions. So, got a few minutes left. I will, if anyone has questions, I didn't leave a ton of time. But any questions about anything security related? Yes. How much, <coughs> how much does the law enforcement get involved? when you catch people like fish and things like this? Um, they do as much as they can, which honestly isn't a lot. Yeah. Um, I work with the University of Police quite a bit, but um, it's hard to catch these people. They're usually in another country, and by the time you would get subpoenas for all the places they popped through, they're gone. Um, so they, they do what they can, but it's, it's pretty tough. Um, and I should you know, say that if, if you are the victim of a crime, contact police. They, they should. They need to file a report. If it happens to enough people, the FBI gets involved, and that's where some of the cyber criminals actually will get caught is when the FBI gets involved. So. The other, th I, I work for uh, media, and the other thing that if you report to the police, if they see this happening, they'll let you know media outlets know, and then other people can learn that this is happening, and they'll fall for it. So right. That's another proactive yeah. thing about letting letting the HSU. Yeah, and that's that's a big thing that we do. About all we can do, uh, we meaning the law enforcement, uh, is is just warn others, uh, and we try to do that. So yeah, definitely, you know, file police reports or, or if it's something that happens with your Fort Hayes accounts, let me know. If it gets to, I, I will reach out to people if needed. Uh, we have a pretty good relationship, uh, but don't expect that they're going to be able to like track down the person and go like pull them out of their mom's basement and arrest them. Like that's probably not going to happen. Um, but they'll help you as much as they can. So, it's a good question. Anything else? Yeah? You talked about security and uh, making sure that you use encryption and uh, you try to use the VPN to secure the network. One thing that I've always wondered since my freshman year here is the student, the TigerNet student, uh, is classified as an unsecured network. Uh, so. How is it that that information is not being intercepted by someone within that network? How, how, how can, I, I don't know, understand the, the inner workings of that, but how do you make it so that way the, the top level people who have a lot of access, such as yourself, aren't able to intercept that, net, that information? Well, I'll say this, and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but I can see everything you're doing. Like anytime, your ISP can see what you're doing. You know, um, you can't hide from everyone uh, unless you go to some pretty extraordinary lengths. But we aren't monitoring your activity. We don't keep records of it for very long. Uh, I think three hours maybe. Um, it's mainly just so we have record of malicious stuff going on. Like if there is a virus spreading, like we need that information to stop it. Um, nothing you do on the internet is a secret flat out unless you are really going to extraordinary lengths. Um, a VPN yeah, kind of helps. Um, so TigerNet student is marked as unsecured because we use just kind of some other, like you have to log in with your username, your TigerNet ID, username and password to get on and then register your device. So there's some other stuff there, but your device will say that it's unsecured. Um, there is some amount of protection in place to keep people from intercepting the traffic, but, um, and this goes to, I mean, it is literally my job to be paranoid, so trust no one, trust no network, use a VPN. Um, the only time I don't use a VPN is when I'm on my home network, because I do actually trust my husband and kids, kind of, um, and when I'm here at work on the faculty staff. Um, but other than that, I'm always on a VPN, just, it encrypts all of your traffic. 
so it makes me feel better. <laughs> um, so why yeah. is the student network not encrypted then? Well, it's because, a, because it, isn't it isn't it a good practice to be on an encrypted network? So when you're not doing that, uh, is it is it unsafe to be doing uh, certain certain transactions? Like uh, um, if if somebody were to send secure bank information, then while while the web page is encrypted, I don't know I don't know how an unsecure network necessarily makes that less secure or whether the bank is secure enough to, to keep all that information secure but I feel as if there there is a security hole in, in place and it I, the way that I'm looking at it is is I'm seeing it as a back door for someone to look in and monitor information and that is true on any wireless network okay you know, because you're transmitting your stuff through the air, right? Yeah. It's out there. Um, and yeah, so one of the things we are looking at is, um, because me and the network admin don't like that TigerNet student shows up as, as unsecured, um, even though it is, it shows up that way. Uh, so we are looking at redoing that whole infrastructure. It's just a lot of time and money um, to get that all kind of reworked, because we still need students to log in with a different password, right? So like, that kind of adds a layer um, to how that all works. Um, you want to really get into the technical stuff we can um, <laughs> offline. But um, no, I, I guess I feel comfortable on TigerNet student, um, but I would still use a VPN just because I do. Um, but just a good practice. And I said, I'm literally paid to be paranoid. Like, <laughs> so I am probably more paranoid. But I I wouldn't be doing sending anything plain text that you don't want people to see. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, you know, talk to me sometimes. But um, I'm always willing to talk to you. Any of that, and we are looking at reworking that whole so that in, entire infrastructure so that it does show is secured. Um, just because it is kind of a safety thing, or you know, it makes you feel safe. <clears throat> Any other questions? Are we good? I'm going to start the class session. If you have other questions that you think of later, um, you can email me. Either just do security at fhsu.edu will get to me, or look me up, um, Jessica States, on our website. I'm always happy to talk to students or anyone about any security questions you have. So just let me know. Thank you guys.